trying to solve uh, a root cause and maybe that's a picture of a tree with a bunch of roots and at the top is all the things that you see as pain points what's the underlying things down in the roots you know picture of a pizza with different slices missing or a test tube with different levels of liquid in it and a thermometer with a heat check like there's a million things that are all kind of the same variation of parts of a whole. I'm not looking at this as art. In the team environment, I'm looking at it as a productivity tool. Hello and welcome to Tech for Finance, where we help finance pros stay ahead of the game, develop their skills and free up time for the things that matter most using technology. Please like and subscribe. Hey everyone. So today we have the pleasure of introducing Mike Manalak, accounting manager at Google, also runs Mike from Accounting. Um, he's written a book, No Flux Given, um, and we'll, we'll tell you how to, to hook up with him a bit later on. It's just it's Mike from accounting.com, isn't it? Um, but really, uh, really pleased to have you on the show, Mike. We've been, we've been speaking for quite a while, haven't we? It's taken us a, a while to have this conversation, so it's good to finally have you on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's uh, good to be on, Adam, and uh, I know you've had a lot of cool cool guests on in the past, so hopefully... Uh, this is an, another one in the uh, in the portfolio of podcasts, but you, you've had some really interesting topics, so I'm sure we're going to get into some good stuff too. So hopefully your audience, uh, some of it resonates with your audience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and Mike and I, we have caught up before this, and we had the conversation that, that we normally you know have, which is the, <clears throat> how much do you want me to talk about tech? And, it, and it's fine, you know, we, we can talk a little bit about tech, but I think it's important sometimes that, you know, we, we broaden our horizons a little bit and think a little bit differently. So having interesting guests like you to um, challenge, us, challenge us to maybe think a little bit differently, I think is is a good move every now and then. So, uh, no, we really, really appreciate you coming on. So I want to start with one of your passions, which is which is drawing, right? So if you go to the website, you'll, you'll see, um, but they're amazing. Um, so the way that you describe it is um, you can bring an idea to life in minutes, no AI required, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, if you go to the website, you'll also see, and, and I don't know whether you've still got it, Mike, but one of the walls in your house is a big chalk mural, isn't it? I should have done, we should have done the podcast in there. I got a big to-do <laughs> list on it today, so... Uh... I'm not going to expose everyone out to my 15 bulleted uh, to-do list, but yeah, it's a full full wall in the kitchen that's a chalkboard wall, and uh, use it to as kind of like a, you know different mural. Or if I ever have like an idea of something I want to you know put up on the wall, I'm able to do that. So it's it's pretty fun. And do you so do you do you wipe it clean every day, or do you just like keep stuff up there to remind? How how does it work? Uh, yeah, sometimes I use it more for like a list or something to, to jot a note down those kind of things I'll, I'll wipe down every day. But a lot of times I'll use it if there's like a holiday coming up or we're having like some people over or a party or something. Uh, if it's themed or I don't know if if I just have an idea of something to put up, I'll try and do it because it's floor to ceiling, you know, end to end. Uh, I need a ladder and everything to kind of put the whole thing together. So I'm not erasing that every day. If I put something up that's full scale wall size, it's up <laughs> for at least uh, three or four weeks until I get bored of it. But um, a lot of times it, it'll be like I'll put something up for Christmas and then, you know, come February, I, I'm kind of a little tired of seeing the Christmas stuff and I got to get rid of it. So, but it's a, it's a fun, fun way of keeping things fresh. It's hard to pick out wall decor i feel like that that doesn't get old after a while so that helps what where did it come from because i mean you you wouldn't always put accounting in like illustration and that that i mean you know everybody's different right but they don't often go hand in hand so was it did it come from when you were young i mean is it is it always been a passion how's how's that sort of emerged yeah well first of all thanks for the kind words on like some of the drawings i i it's funny, like I'm not, I, I look at them as a little bit of a, a, a grade above maybe a doodle or like a cartoon. So that's not, a, not, not trying to put out the next Mona Lisa here, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's mainly just been a, a hobby of mine growing up. Like I think most people kind of draw when they're, they're younger or, or doodle and things. And it's, it's kind of funny. Cause I think you have, you have young kids too. I've got a kid in daycare now. They have like crayons out they're drawing they're doing arts and crafts every day 
at a certain point, I don't know, middle school, seventh, eighth grade or something, you kind of stop doing that. The whole creative push from the educational institution kind of slows down. Um, and I think people just kind of lose it. And then I think the other thing is if people draw something and it, it doesn't look like Mona Lisa, you know, they feel a little, there's, there's criticism and people just kind of pull back. So they stop playing around with it. Um, for the most part, I never really, I never got fully into it. Like I was drawing and trying to, to take an art route by any means, but it was always a big note taker. So it was always jotting little pictures down on the side of my notes. And, um, and then that's kind of progressed a little bit. I, uh, I'm on a big team at work. And when I was living out in San Francisco, we used to do uh, a card for everybody's birthday or work anniversary or engagement or any of those. Every day you'd have like three, there's hundred people on the team. There'd be like three cards on your desk. And they all said the same thing. Congratulations. Happy birthday. And uh, for some reason, I didn't want to just say the same thing over and over again. So I would draw a little picture and uh, it ended up actually boosting my drawing skills pretty good just because I'm always drawing in these cards. And um, I started doing that and and that kind of got me into thinking, well, I wonder where else I could incorporate drawing into uh, the accounting space. Because to your point, like it, it, it doesn't really go hand in hand. It's not like a natural marriage. Um, but when COVID hit, everyone went work from home and collaboration got very clunky when you're, you know, as opposed to being in the office. And I started leveraging a digital whiteboard as like a go to uh, virtual tool that was perfect for collaboration uh, when you have a distributed team like I do. Uh, and also when everyone's working remotely, working from home. So uh, I started sketching out my team's ideas, my ideas on a digital whiteboard. We could all see it in front of us the the team could participate drop sticky notes and youtube videos and memes and stuff and it was like a one pager of of our meetings and that was the probably the first time i said hey that was actually kind of fun like that was a brainstorm session that was fun i got to do a little bit of doodling and drawing and it was actually very much solving problems and being productive and that became a little bit of a, a whole thing you know i didn't see many other people doing that uh, or even leveraging uh, virtual tools beyond, hey, I can send a ping, I can use a Google Doc, and I can do Zoom. But that's the same stuff people use today that they used in the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's all these virtual tools out there. So I started kind of playing around with the digital whiteboard, and that helped me incorporate you know, the hobby side of drawing with actual productivity at work. Uh, and bringing, making it a little bit more fun, which I think in the accounting space, like you need all the fun you can get. So incorporating that made it, made it a little bit more fun. And, and honestly, whenever you can bring in an outside interest to what you're getting paid to do and your actual work, you know, that's where, really where fulfillment comes into play. And, and, you know, you start to, uh, you know, part of your, your work starts to feel like play. And I think that's, that's a good thing. And, and you really hit it there. Because play is different to to everyone, isn't it? And and I, I keep meaning to do this because I mean, people can see there's like drum kits and guitars about and that yeah. sort of stuff. And I feel like I've lost touch with it a little bit because I can't blame the kids for everything, right? Because I still find the time to record podcasts and produce content and all of that sort of stuff. But I think it is important to find play wherever you can. And as you say, if you, you if you can sneak it into work, that's that's great. And I often find. And, and it's bizarre. I don't, don't really categorize myself into, you know, visual learner or kinetic learner or, you know, uh, audio learner or whatever the, the categories are. I kind of use a, a combination of all, I guess, like wh whatever works, right? Yep. But when I'm at home, <coughs> it's as you say, it's documents, spreadsheets, presentations. You know, it's, it's, it's very linear. You know, um, and whenever I go into the office and I, I meet with the team, the first thing that I do is go into the collab room and I draw all over the whiteboard. It's, it is difficult simulating that remotely. So I'm curious to know from you, you say a virtual whiteboard, I, I get it. You know, I mean, we use Teams. It sounds like you use a, use a bit of Zoom and, and all of that sort of stuff. 
but on Teams, it's it's very difficult to draw if you've got a keyboard and, and mouse. So do you have a do you have a tablet that's hooked up so that you can actually properly draw? How, how does that work? Because I've got a little tablet. I can't remember what the brand mm. is, but to me, it's not big enough. Do you know what I mean? I, mm. I can't actually move my hand enough. So yeah, it facilitates drawing, but it's just not. I just don't think it's ergonomically suitable for actually doing proper, like big movement. So do you have a, how do you do it? Yeah, uh, there is a hardware component to it. And uh, so I have a tablet, it's a galaxy tablet, I think S7. So maybe a, a generation or two behind, but it comes with a stylus. It's called the S pen. You know, it's not, I think it's partially a productivity kind of tablet, but really it's like an entertainment tablet. Like it's not, solely meant for uh you know virtual digital whiteboards and stuff but you can it's very versatile you can use it in that way so that's one where to your point drawing or trying to write something out with your mouse i mean that's that's a pretty bad user experience people aren't going to really do it uh what i found too is that if i'm able to lead the session with the tablet and the stylus and get stuff out there um to, to ask everyone to do the exact same thing I'm doing is very uh, daunting. And I think, you know, you give, you give an account and a pen and say, draw something or put something, you know, people kind of get scared and skittish and in a collaborative environment, you're trying to have like an open, safe space. So uh, what I like about digital whiteboards, it's it, drawing is the, the function I use a lot to kind of keep everything together and, and make it more dynamic but other people are using other aspects of that whiteboard. Like I had mentioned dropping in sticky notes, you can add text boxes, you can drop in a picture, you can do wire framing, you can draw arrows from one thing to another thing and, and videos. You can actually embed like a Google Sheet or a Google Doc. And if you update it in the whiteboard, it actually saves it into the cloud, like into the spreadsheet. So a lot of what I'm using it for is I'm probably the main one using the stylus and the sketching out uh, the team's thoughts and ideas, trying to connect some of those dot, dots, but others are using the other features that are maybe a little bit easier to to use from the functions of the application of, you know, if you're using Miro or the, you know, like you mentioned, Zoom has a built-in whiteboard, uh, mm -hmm. um, Slack has another one, Teams have, has another one. They all have these digital whiteboards in the finance space. If you were to take a poll, less than 5% of people are using them. You know, they exist everywhere. They're within five clicks of everybody and nobody's using it. And for me, that that also was like, well, maybe that's an opportunity. That whole aspect of a, a digital whiteboard is built for collaboration. And yet nobody in finance is using it that way. So there is some little hurdles, like you said, like not everybody's going to whip out a tablet or a style, you know, have the stylus and stuff, but um, you don't need everybody to. You really just need everyone participating in the discussion in whatever way they feel comfortable with. And a lot of people, even if they had the tablet, the best, they had the new Apple Pencil and tablet and everything, they're not gonna feel comfortable, you know, writing stuff out uh, on a digital whiteboard. And that's okay. I think you, you just gotta, kinda gotta find how, what's the best way of getting the great insights that are in my team's head out onto something tangible that we can move around. And sometimes that could be in like, I'm sketching it out with, with the stylus. And sometimes that can be a text box that I'm dragging around. And uh, I think that's what makes the tool really cool. And I'm always shocked that not that many people use it, but you know, that could change, you know, with the, the work from home shift becoming what looks to be permanent, at least in a hybrid way, People are going to need to start to leverage those other tools because collaboration is very hard to do in a remote space. You mentioned it yourself. You get in a room, you can get on that whiteboard. That's very clunky to just pick that same process up and take it home. And eventually, I think work from home is not going away. And I think leadership is going to need to find ways of you know, promoting some of these virtual tools and making sure that uh, their staff are trained and upskill themselves to really lead a team in this new environment because for right now nobody's really been trained in how to lead a team virtually it, it kind of just is like go wing it and I hope you can do it you know so it's a it's a funny time to be in corporate America or, or even in the business world I'd say yeah and and, and I, I struggle so so I'm, I'm fully remote I go to the office once a week and it's it's great 
you know, because that's the day of meetings and we, we can collaborate. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. one of the, the company values is, is collaboration. But from a remote perspective, it's, it's difficult to distance yourself from, from a world outside of a screen, a keyboard and a mouse. Yeah. And, and just as you've been talking through that, um, I've got an iPad, like quite a nice iPad. It's an iPad Pro. So I, I, need, I probably need to find a way to hook that up to my PC, don't I? And just use it as a as an interface. I can probably do that, yeah. right? I'm sure there's a way of doing that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff is in the cloud. So, you know, as, if you can share your screen, which everybody knows how to share their screen in a virtual meeting, well, you just pull up a new tab and you pull up a digital whiteboard. You know, it's a... Uh, and or you use the built-in application through the interface of like mm. teams or whatever so that's what i was saying it is so easy you don't need some fancy hdmi converter to USB-C to lightning cable you don't need i mean you don't need any of that so the the barrier to entry isn't necessarily the tech that's kind of why i didn't mention it too much i think it's there i think the barrier to entry is just it's an atypical way for accountants to work and other finance professionals. But when when you see it happen it, uh, and, and people are engaged, uh, I think it's hitting all the right notes. And if, if you look at other, you know, I'm fortunate to work with occasionally some other design teams and engineer teams and product ma- managers. To them, that's a fluent way of doing something is to jump on a whiteboard and, and, and you know, workflow out something. And the collaboration is really fun to be a part of that hasn't translated to the business teams, even though it's working so well on one side of, of the house. And uh, and I think it's unfortunate, but it's also, I think, ripe for opportunity. There's no reason we don't use it other than it's unfamiliar. I think realizing it, I think most people remember visuals more than heavy text or even like slide decks, especially yeah. if they see stuff being created in front of them so they say obviously a picture paints a thousand words right and and that's mm-hmm. true but I'll, I'll caveat that by saying that seeing a picture being drawn goes a step further than that because i in my view it helps internalize the a to b the mm-hmm. step one to step two if you can see the way that it is built up in the way that you're saying you're doing so when you have one of these sessions what's what's your go-to visual is it like um a central theme and then you've got your strands branching out with input or is it more like a a process flow are we talking boxes connect with with arrows what's the i'm just trying to match up the sort of conversation that you'd have as an accounting team and how that how that makes its way onto a visual discussion versus a sharing documents and slide discussion yeah it's a it's a good question and i think Maybe that's one of the biggest barriers is when you're looking at a blank page or a blank whiteboard, it's very daunting. You know, like we always talk about being able to succeed and 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 navigate ambiguity. There's nothing more ambiguous than a blank piece of paper, you know, uh, or or something like that. So um, the recommendation I give, and I actually have a course out there called Sketchy Business Practices, which gets into this a little bit more, but one of the tips I give is is uh, if you don't know what to do, draw a circle and put the topic in the middle of it. And then it just becomes a mind map. You have the spokes that come off of it with the different ideas that your team is shouting. That'll usually highlight a theme. You know, you step back and you look at what kind of theme is coming from that. Maybe it's a problem to solve. Maybe it's a process efficiency that seems kind of clunky. Maybe it's a, uh, a sequence of events type thing that you're trying to work through. And then basically from there, you can say, well, what's a good next step to kind of tease out this brain dump that was just done in a mind map with a circle and a bunch of spokes? What's the best way to, 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 to move forward with that? Because it's not always going to be uh, a flow chart isn't going to fit for everything. A timeline isn't going to fit for ev- everything. Um, and a part of that is, you know, I, I have a section of, uh, uh, did I did I break down the different elements to try to break it down into five elements and and one of them is frameworks, which is no different than how we all use templates. You know, everybody uses templates, especially in accounting with financials and rolling over work papers. All everything is a template. Like 
very few things start from scratch. So once you have like some templates in mind of, oh, here's what a timeline could look like. Here's now, here's the future state. What are all the pieces in between? Then it makes it a little easier to start filling in the blanks. Or maybe you're trying to solve uh, a root cause. And maybe that's a picture of a tree with a bunch of roots. And at the top is all the things that you see as pain points. What's the underlying things down in the roots, you know? Or uh, parts of a whole is another good one too, where when you say parts of a whole, that could be like, well, how, mu how much manpower hours does it take to finish this spreadsheet um, as far as the entire close process for the quarter? Uh, so you can see what are the areas that maybe there could be process efficiencies. I mean, that's as simple as like a pie chart, you know, breaking it down into different sections to visually show what's what's uh, what's um, represents a greater piece of it. You can do a picture of a pizza with different slices missing or uh, a test tube with different levels of liquid in it and a thermometer with a heat check. Like there's a million things that are all kind of the same variation of a parts of a whole. And uh, so anyway, I, I think a lot of the ways that I'll do it, I, I have a, a handful of frameworks that I feel like can work in a lot of those situations. Because most of the time, it's probably a sequence, a timeline, um, uh, a decision between option A or option B is another one that happens a lot. Uh, or it's just the brainstorming, let's see where it goes, which is more of the mind map, which is like, you know, the circle with the spokes and the you know popcorn, get, the popcorn, uh, idea there and things coming off of that so it all starts with the framework there's no one size fits all but it's also again it's not i'm not looking at this as art in the team environment i'm looking at it as a productivity tool uh and i think to your point about people appreciating the process they're not looking for art either you know if you can do a funny little picture that goes along with it like that's great and it kind of makes it more fun but you don't really need that. It's not about the art. It's about the process and just getting your ideas down. So to me, I think it's more valuable. You mentioned like being able to get, get a picture out of your mind and onto paper without the AI. Like, uh, I feel like the power is being able to do that quickly, not in let come back to me in two weeks and I'll have a beautiful picture for you like that doesn't interest me my attention spans too short for that like i'll lose interest and have a million other things i want to do but if i can think of something really quick and i can get it down very quick that's pretty powerful and uh and so again it gets it gets back to you're not shooting for perfection you're just trying to get the team's ideas down and once people see those ideas you know our brains have a certain amount of working memory once you put it down on paper or on a digital whiteboard, it allows you to say, okay, I don't need to think about that anymore. It's already there. What, it, what else can I free up my headspace to think about? I can always come back to that. And usually by the end of the session, I, I step back and um, try to do some sort of an analysis on, well, where do we stand now? And, and I connect some dots and we issue out some action items for the various members of the team. And we're all have the same unified vision and we all are going at about the same plan and we can go execute after that. And it, it feels like a very team oriented approach where it's not me telling you go do this. We all came up with this. The ideas came from our discussion and then it makes it a little easier to motivate people to kind of go forth and, and work on that project because it's not like a directive, Mike told me to go do this, so I'm doing it. Like this is a team thing, we all bought into it. Um, so it's, and that's, that's what collaboration really, you know, is the byproduct of collaboration, which is why everyone likes to say collaboration is important, but I don't know that everyone is that great at collaborating. Yeah. Co collaboration is not sitting in a room and going through some KPIs, you know, it's, it's not a review of what's good versus last week versus what's bad versus last week. You know, that's, that's not co collaboration that could be done remotely. You know, it might, yeah. that might not even be a meeting, you know, yeah. that might just be like a one pager, yeah. <laughs> you know, or, or a video that I could record of myself running through a slide deck, you know, that's, yeah. that's reporting. That's not collaboration. So you say the collaboration comes from that, that shared idea piece and, and coming back to what you've just said there in terms of, inspiring and having people take something away 
I think you're absolutely right because firstly, there's an extra element of joy in the meeting. Yeah, so, so they're, they're likely to be more receptive and more excited about sitting in a meeting with Mike. Oh, I love getting into meetings with Mike because, you know, he draws all these cool characters and, you know, everything makes so much sense because I can see it on one page. Mm-hmm. And then that energy continues outside the, the collaboration piece, which then in turn is more likely to lead to better results come the next meeting because they remember where they were, they were inspired to do something next. Yeah. So if you can keep that momentum going, it's a lot better than people thinking, oh, have I really got to go into that other meeting where we just talk about the numbers again? Or, uh, oh, let me share my slide deck. And you mentioned like, here's a bunch of blocks of text. Let me go to slide one of 50. Man, you lost the whole team, you know? And if you look at any good sales materials or the last product that any of us bought, it's not a whole block of text or, you know, 15 pages you got to read. It's a one pager with a few big things trying to get your attention. And uh, that's the type of, of way that I think is engaging to people. They don't want to have to sift through a bunch of slide deck presentations. Or if you're just going to get and present and read verbatim off of the deck, why did you need a live meeting for that? You could have recorded a loom to your point or like you could have just shared the deck with me. Like what's the point of that? And and that's not that's why I think the, the stat is something like Team engagement, I think, for managers now in a virtual environment is three to four times harder than in the office. And I think that's not because I want to go back to the office five days a week. I think why I push this uh, so hard that there is a good way of doing collaboration virtually is because I don't want to go back to the office five days a week. So don't say you got to go back because collaboration is falling short and our teams aren't engaged. That's a scapegoat. That's a cop-out answer. You can do those things virtually. You just need people that can do it. You need to train your people the right way, get them onto tools to to actually do it Um, because it can be very engaging. It can be very collaborative, but at least in my opinion, I've been in a couple, couple, a lot of big firms and a couple Fortune 500s, and this has been true everywhere. You go into a meeting with 10 plus people you look around the room, most people are on mute in the virtual environment, not that many, God forbid, maybe a few cameras are off, you know, who knows what's (laughs) happening there. And then if, if you, if you ask anybody have any questions or comments, most likely you're going to get radio silence. Second, most likely there's going to be one to two people that chime in that just so happen to be the same one to two people that always chime in. Well, what about the other eight people? You know what I mean? And, and I think, uh, that's not engagement. That's not engagement, you know, and it's a, it's a challenge that I think we all face. And that could happen in a live meeting too, in, in a room. But I think when you're having lunch with somebody, you're having a coffee chat, and then you go jump in a room and you're looking at them in the eye, you're sitting next to them. They're probably more likely to speak up than having to raise their hand feature and, or I don't want to talk over somebody. So they go off mute. Like, it's a li- it's a small little barrier in a virtual environment, but I feel like it it keeps a lot of people quiet that otherwise might be more outspoken. And I think the execs are saying, "Oh, we got to go back to the office," which I feel like is not not the answer either. You've got you've got to get a balance. And and from my perspective, time with people is very important. Yeah. But time by yourself for deep work is also very important. So the the more easy that you can segment these these are the meetings where we need the energy you know we need to we need to bring it versus the deep work that people can do themselves the the better mm-hmm. you know um, but especially in larger organisations it's it's always difficult right because if you're giving people the flexibility to work on their own schedule so you say we've got a hybrid working policy that's you know three days at home two days in the office or two days at home three days in the office then managing the people that are going to be on site on that day, that that becomes a logistical nightmare in itself, doesn't it? So it's impossible yeah. to be able to say everybody's in on Thursday for these meetings yeah. because you, you're going to be met with pushback, you know, and that that then loses the whole, the whole premise of uh, hybrid working, which is flexibility in working environments. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's not an easy task at all. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a little bit of a catch-22 because – 
people complain if they come into the office and their team isn't there because they say, what was the point of me coming in if I'm just going to sit on a video conference all day? Valid point. But then if you tell them, okay, let's all come in on Thursday, then you got people saying, well, don't tell me when to come in. Like I have three days I get to pick and choose. Uh, so it's a slippery slope, like, especially with the bigger team, my team, the team I manage is a, a size of five. We've all tried to make a best effort. It's funny. You mentioned Thursday. We make a best effort to come in on Thursday, whatever you do with your other two days, it doesn't matter what days those are. But if we can, let's try to be in the office on Thursday. Obviously, stuff comes up. But that just gives us a better chance of being able to run into each other. It sounds like we sh we structure it similar to your one day in the office, where that's a very live, meeting-heavy day. Our brainstorm meetings are that day. Uh, we have team lunches and all those things. Because I agree, like, I don't personally want to never see my team in person. Like, I want some of that. I think there is value to that. But it doesn't need to be five days a week. It can definitely be less than that. Um, but it, it's hard because trying to get everyone on the same schedule is is one part of the challenge. The other part of the challenge is, I mean, most in bigger organizations especially, but even in smaller organization, organizations where you're outsourcing pieces of your work or subcontracting, you probably have a distributed team anyway where they're living across the country or, you know, you're in the UK and I'm in Chicago in the US, like, it doesn't matter. We're never going to be able to all get into the same office. That's not an excuse to say we never work with anybody outside of our local location. That's that's kind of an ancient way of thinking. Um, so there might even in those hybrid situations where where the team that sits in Chicago with me is there with me on Thursday in the room. I still have people in L.A. that are video conferencing in and other people from Austin, Texas conferencing in. I'm not going to get around that. But at, it's about as close as you can get to all being in the in one room at the same time. And uh, and so that's what we shoot for. But it, it definitely takes, you know, a, a lot of t people getting on the same page and and being flexible, too, with if you're sh if you're trying to get the ideal scenario where you're all singing Kumbaya in one boardroom, it's probably not going to happen, even in the best case scenario, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how it goes because, I mean, forgetting about the AI piece for a second, which, of course, has is, is gone mad recently. People, maybe because they're distracted by the AI piece, aren't seeing some of the amazing stuff that's happening with, with hardware. So you, you mentioned, obviously, your, your Galaxy Tab, which is, you know, your hardware that enables you to do the whiteboarding sessions. But I, I kind of feel like... Um, was it the, the latest Apple release? I can't remember the headset, which was the, the augmented reality piece. And there was, there was YouTube videos of like uh, teenagers sitting on the train, like you know, work, working through it because, because he had it in a, like a virtual reality yeah. environment around him. Right. And I feel like they've been downplayed a little bit because there's been a, you know, more interesting and more sort of like job threatening focus. Oh, I don't care about a headset. I'm worried about, you know, how AI is going to take over my job. But I think it's important to see that. And and I read something today as well about smart contact lenses, which I, I had not heard of before. I'd, I'd heard about the smart glasses and I've seen the adverts, you know, for the Ray-Bans that have got like the, the little, um, you know, uh, the little lenses that can produce visuals like a heads up display sort of mm -hmm. thing. But they're now creating technology that these smart lenses can charge themselves from the moisture in your eyes. Wow. You know, and that's and that, that it is insane. That's that is absolutely insane. insane. You know, yeah. so so right now we're talking about how there's a barrier to you and I sitting on the other side of the world to each other. But I, I don't think it's going to be long before we can sit in our pod. You know, so I won't mm -hmm. have an office. I'll have an office pod with a 360 surround or a visor or whatever, I can almost sit with somebody in person because we're both in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. And I know that I know the metaverse is, there's been a lot of hype around that. I think mainly because people don't understand it and also because nobody's actually really managed to illustrate clear use cases apart from putting on some goggles and pretending you're like some sort of cartoon avatar. Yeah, so it's not, it's not real enough yet, but it will come. But I'm interested to see where it goes because we talked a little bit about energy there, you know, and, and to use another example from today. So 
I was one of the few that was actually remote today. <clears throat> and there was a team of eight in the office that I was I was leading a session with. And people know me, like I'm quite happy chappy. You know, I'm, I'm quite energetic. I've got a lot to say, right? So it's been a useful exercise for me having these podcasts because it trains me not to speak over people, which is what I used to do. <laughs> we used to do that quite a lot. But I was bringing the energy on my side through my camera. But for whatever reason, I don't know what happened in the office, but the eight people on the other side of the camera it was, it was like somebody died and I don't know what had gone in the office, but there are eight people that were highly distracted and their mind was obviously somewhere else. And I can jump around and, you know, swing my arms and shout as much as I like, but my energy isn't going to compensate for the combined lack of energy across the eight people in the room. So the reason I mentioned that is yes, we might in the future have the tech that enables us to virtually place ourselves next to each other. But are we going to have the physical energy? And I, I don't know. You know, that's that, that's a bigger question, I guess. But I think it's one thing to be better connected and be able to draw on a whiteboard and have people patch in and you see people's cameras and that sort of stuff. But it's the energy that comes from those meetings in that collaborative environment that is the way that you then create that momentum that you inspire and do whatever. You know, you think of like massive arenas, massive keynote speeches where people get standing evasions. It's because you've got that combined energy in the room. You've got that like um, group think, you know, that hive mind that's all kind of in sync. And I think that's going to be really like, anyway, I've got, I've gone a bit meta there. Like yeah, I mentioned yeah, the metaverse, yeah. but that is a bit meta. But I think <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thought experiment because I think the hardware will catch up soon. It's just how we adopt it at the end of the day. But that's, that's the biggest problem, you know, with all tech and, and all business change is, is the adoption. Yeah, I think you, you bring up a good point and, you know, I, I totally see the tech being there too. That's why I don't think the right answer is to go back to how we did it pre-COVID because I definitely think things have, have, have already moved forward well beyond that as far as never going back to the always being in the, in the office. It'll either be hybrid and the hybrid version will probably be more of this virtual type environment and maybe that's in a Vision Pro where somebody's holding a meeting on the train right or maybe it's the the metaverse example which i agree i think the rollout of that was clunky because everybody looked like a cartoon but the concept made made a lot of sense and i I think that tech is pretty pretty close to being there um well maybe not close to being there but close to rolling out to to the masses and actually seeing that happen um but the point that you raised about being able to do everything you want to be engaging in still not being able to control the temperature in another room. I think part of that is that I'd like to think that technology will help with that because even in like, say a metaverse experience or maybe a vision pro with everybody feeling like they're in the same room, it's much harder to do some of the things that would normally be considered rude, which is like not paying it, obviously not paying attention. And we're all distracted by a million. If it's not your phone or your watch, it's somebody's pinging you on your laptop. The fact that somebody's presenting a slide deck on the screen, you've already tried to do a million other things. But once you feel like you're in the room, it is a little harder to just disengage, you know? And I think whether you engage because you're in the room or you engage because you feel like you're in the room, I'm hoping that that's something that tech does solve, number one. And then number two, I'm hoping that just the environment and and the way that the presentation goes, because I do think a lot of it is the way you present. There's plenty of boring speakers out there who could have the exact same message, read the exact same cue cards as somebody with a lot of maybe charisma and stage presence, and one gets a standing ovation and the other gets a couple silent claps, you know? Uh, So a lot of that is the energy, but... I also think it's what you're doing, what you're doing energy plus the tools that you're using at that time. Like we keep, I keep hating on the slide deck, which is funny because I at least present the slide deck a day. But the, the whole point is like, you know, how you're using that I think does matter. Like for instance, the, uh, I was, I was working on a a digital ad campaign for a big uh, DNA company that, you know, you would know if, if I said the name of it. And they were going through how come my ad campaign isn't doing as well for the the advertising spend that I'm doing. And they went through and it it was a quick clip. It didn't have any audio. 
and it was kind of like stock photo type stuff. And the team I was working with, the YouTube team, was giving the rundown of all the reasons as to why or ways that it can be better. And one of them was obviously add music. You have to appeal to the different senses, right? Sometimes senses is hard to get in a virtual environment. So play some audio with that and develop the relationship, like kind of pull like what emotion are you trying to invoke from that? If you're not invoking an a emotion, it's easy for that person to not be engaged. And then the other thing was the visuals they were using were very stock. Even if you look at the AI images that everyone likes to play around with, now like show me a unicorn playing on the drum set on the moon, you can do that and that's cool. It's a good, no like a novelty kind of thing, but it's all starting to look the same. And one day that's gonna look like the old clip art. And one of the things that came out of that uh, presentation from the YouTube team was uh, hand-drawn images, because they're imperfect, they stop the scroll. And people, it catches their eye because it's different. Because most people aren't doing that. So I think there's more of that, yes, it's the tech, yes, it's the engaging leader, but it's also what tools are you using within that environment to evoke emotion outside of the engagement, outside of the, 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 the leader being engaging, how are you appealing to their senses with, with the right visuals and the right sound stuff and maybe even like haptic feedback if I were to reach and shake your hand? Like there could be stuff like that, you know? And, and uh, I'm very interested to see where it goes. And if anything, I, I think it's, it's encouraging. I think it's gonna make the business more global even though it already kind of is. Um, and I'm, I'm also really curious just to pivot the conversation a little bit as to how does that impact like accounting and finance professionals? You know, I'm in, the, I'm in the States, so how does it impact the accounting and finance professionals that are US based, which right now there's a big shortage. I think there is probably globally too for finding those staff, but um, you know, that's going to put a pressure on wages and people can continue to pay, increase compensation, which I hope they do, right? Employers, I hope that they do. But at some point, if you're in this global environment and you take time zones out of it and you can all put on a headset and feel like you're in the same room, is that opportunity going to go to this high paid US CPA or is it going to go to somebody in the Philippines or India who's doing it for a fraction of the cost, which in the past used to kind of be frowned upon because it felt like, you wanted to keep it local. I think once you, be, you become more global, it doesn't, you know, boundaries are blurred big time. And that shortage that everyone's talking about, is it is it not as acute as we all think it is because it's just gonna be filled with global workers. Uh, it's another thing that I'm, I'm curious to see how it plays out too, because it's probably really good for those overseas, maybe being doing the offshore services might not be so great for the local teams that are looking for the increased compensation and is maybe going slower than they thought. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, we'll just end up building side hustles, right? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe the W-2 employee is, or I guess I should say maybe like the 40 hour a week employee is now fractioned off and maybe you, everyone has three or four kind of jobs. I don't know. Really quick guys, as you know, I don't run ads and I no longer sell anything on here. So to help me, it'd be great if you could share with just one other person, leave a review, give a thumbs up and subscribe. It really does make a difference. Now back to the show. I, I can see it. So, you know, we have the tools now for, for people to build, you know, small businesses easier than ever. Um, Yes, maybe the large organizations will be able to justify heavier amounts of outsourcing potentially if that's part of their business plan. But smaller businesses, you know, that are very much still in the same location and, you know, need, need to build centrally, they might need fractional support. You, you never know. I mean, I've, I've seen a bit of a trend, especially in the SME space, towards CFOs becoming more fractional. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a is probably the money, you know, and they think, right, well, I've got to CFO now and I can either get the next grade of CFO role or I can just go fra fractional and work less time and earn the same amount of money or if not more money. So it, it will be interesting to see how it goes. But then you've, you've obviously got then the, 
the whole economic situation, which you know I have. I have no knowledge of global economics, so so mm-hmm. you know um, I, I am by no means the expert in saying this. But at some point, the other economies will have to catch up. You know, right now there's a, a big variance in pay based on you know cost of living and all of you know the various currency conversions and whatever. But there's all of these sort of poorer in inverted commas regions across the world get more prosperous and they get more teched up there's going to be less of a of a gap between salaries i think i mean the the horizon is obviously much further away than the now yeah. and of course you know i do it you know so i outsource some of my work to yeah. um people in bangladesh and, and the philippines and, and all sorts because they're still bright people yeah but it cost me six dollars an hour instead of 60 <laughs> yeah. and how do you how do you how do you turn that down you know that's it that's yeah. it but i think that there will always be a job for intelligent humans you know but i hope there is and and we've spoken before on the podcast and we've got super deep into like future of ai and all of that sort of stuff we don't we don't have to do that today but i think you raise a you definitely raise a valid point but just bringing it back a, a second, I, I wanted to, to, before I forget, just drill you a little bit more on what you said about the work that you did with that customer, you know, in terms of the advice around, you know, it doesn't need to be more visual, doesn't need to be more, uh, what you know, the, some of the stuff that you said there. It's interesting that you got involved in those conversations. Is, is that a regular occurrence or? I, I wouldn't say necessarily a regular occurrence, but that's also... I consider myself a creative person. The fact that I'm at, at Google, which is a creative company that's always yeah. looking for creative people, that's not by accident. That was kind of where I thought I, I might thrive. And not everybody wants to hear from the accountant the next greatest idea. You know, you know. Whereas I feel like I do get a little bit more of a seat at the table. One, you have to earn. But if you can earn that seat at the table, people will listen and, and there's opportunities to chime in. Um, so in that case, you know, the the space that I'm in is I support the ad revenue side of it. So I handle the accounting for all of, uh, not me personally, but the 100 person team for all of Google search and YouTube and some other products, uh, which is for anybody who doesn't know, um, Google's mainly a digital ad business is where we get mm-hmm. most of the revenue. Um, so it's a big chunk of the business. And I work on a, a pretty cool segment, which is uh, working with sales teams uh, that are working with our big advertising clients, trying to get them to invest more in digital ad spend at, at Google, across the Google properties, and then to adopt our latest products. Whenever we're pushing a new product, how can we get our biggest customers to take advantage of that? And that usually involves coming up with some deal of, hey, you spend some more money, I'll give you some discounts, I'll I'll run some free impressions on your next you know, World Cup campaign, kind of stuff like that, and different incentive packages that are, are pretty customized based on, you know, whether you're talking about a McDonald's or a Netflix, like uh, the, the package is going to be very different. Whereas in this ca- in that scenario, I represent the accounting team and I'm sitting in a virtual room with uh, somebody who's representing the legal team and the compliance team and the engineering team and the sales team and the FP&A team. And, and that's where sort of some of those, you know, when people think you're in accounting, they probably are thinking you're working with a bunch of other accountants and they may not think of it that you're doing a very cross-functional role, which there's a lot of cross-functional roles in the accounting space. That's why everyone keeps saying soft skills are so important. It's not soft skills are important so that you can talk to another accountant. That's easy. We're speaking the same language. But go try and speak some accounting to like a sales lead or somebody in Eng or somebody, you know, legal actually picks it up pretty quick. But like those kind of things, I feel like uh, people don't know necessarily think of accounting as a very cross-functional aspect. So in those cases, I'd get brought into deals like that where it's like, hey, we're trying to do this deal. In this case, what's the biggest pain point for the customer? They're trying to get better, better reach on their campaigns. And I'm sitting in the room for some of that, not all of it client, most of it's not client facing, but very much like structuring what we're trying to do. And, you know, if you're working with sales teams, they're trying to do everything. I'm going to offer everything under the sun. And sometimes they got to get reined in. Well, that's going to really complicate things on my end. And <laughs> trying to get those those sales teams to care 
that what they're proposing is going to be a nightmare on the accounting side. So um, that's sort of how I fit into the organization. It, it's it's probably a pretty unique side of the business, but it's, you know, maybe 15, 20 percent accounting and the rest is like project work and and automation. And, you know, my whole team can can write in SQL and we're writing scripts and workflows and things like that. So it's a little different than maybe a typical uh, accounting team, but that's the part that I love too. You know, it's, it's not a, let me box in this accounting person to do accounting stuff. You know, I have the freedom to kind of stretch a lot of what it means to be an accountant, you know, and I know a lot of your guests, I feel like really stretch those boundaries too. And uh, I think that's part of why I was so excited to come and chat with you. Cause I think a lot of what you talk about, pushes the envelope, I think, of maybe tradition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it is, it is a bit, bit of a niche. You know, I don't I don't have a ton of followers. I mean, you know, maybe coming up to, to a thousand, over a thousand followers now, which, I mean, for podcasts, that's not, it's not bad going, right? Yeah, I mean, we're coming up to, to 70 episodes now. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm always keen on a different perspective um, because it's, it's not, it's not just about, the, the tech that sits in the middle as 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 we know too well you know the the tech is the enabler you know that the people have still got to do the, the job on top of it and and you you mentioned automation they're writing scripts and that mm-hmm. sort of stuff i mean is it your standard excel like vba type stuff or have you got an automation platform that's like the go-to for that sort of you're using like power power automate that oh i should, probably shouldn't say with you being google right probably not, using <laughs> the, probably not using the microsoft stack so what what does automation look like to you without giving away too many secrets yeah, it's not the uh, it's not Excel, which is you know the few things that accountants every accountant knows. I was like to consider myself an Excel wizard, but now I'm a Google Sheets wizard, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. that's pretty much the standard. Is uh, you're not using uh, Excel anymore; you're using Sheets, which, for all intents and purposes, is the same, if not maybe a little better. I guess I'm a little biased, but but then outside of that it's so there's different variations of like we'll do our own homegrown type automation stuff and that's usually through uh sql i don't know how how familiar you are with sql but yeah. you know jo- joining different data sets and pulling different reports and developing uh plex dashboards and things like that and, and creating different workflows that automate a lot of you know manual things that we would normally do that could be like generating a journal entry from a bunch of data, but you know, putting in all the debits and credits and all those kind of things to, to fit into SAP nice and neatly. And then also writing scripts that validate stuff. Like, can I read from the contract tables to make sure that whatever payment I'm about to approve aligns with what's in the contract? Sure, I could go open it up the old school way and check validate everything. Or I can run a script that's feeding off of the tables that generated the contract. And those kind of things that uh, I think is the more exciting side of accounting that maybe people don't talk about a lot, but there's a lot, there's a lot there. And it's funny because people talk about AI, like it's automation is a new thing, but automation has been uh, at the top of every accounting team's uh, to-do list for a decade at least. And I think a lot of people are still just doing stuff in Excel workbooks. And there's a lot in the middle that you can do. You don't necessarily need a AI product or like a co-pilot type thing to, to solve that. You know, I, I think sometimes maybe this is where some of the AI I think is maybe a little overhyped. And then I think everyone's looking for this one click solution to solve everything that I'm doing. And they're skipping a lot of stuff in the middle, which is, look, you want full blown automation, but you're not even doing the, the mid grade automation. And you're trying to go too far. Like, why don't you start like automating some of the stuff you can yourself? And that's the difference between creating a script and a workflow, creating the automation, which is the stuff I was just talking about versus what I think what most people want in the accounting space, which is to be a user of an, of an app or something that somebody else created. Yeah. And there's a huge market for that. But I think at the end of the day, you can't just be a user. You got to be able to do some of the stuff yourself. There's there's a power to that, and in the creation process. And uh, you know, you were mentioning not to go back backwards here, but like you were mentioning like the the creative side of the drawing thing, or even you playing drums and an ambiguous situation. Like you sit at that drum sh- drum set, 
You got right hand on the drumstick, hitting the hi-hat, left on the snare drum, left foot on the hi-hat pedal, right foot on the kick drum pedal, and then you're trying to crash the, the toms and the cymbals in an interlude while you have some sort of rhythm. That's a lot of multitasking. That's completely ambiguous to sit down at a drum set and hand two sticks and say, play something. You know, that creativity, just like in drawing and an ambiguous blank page, it comes into play when you sit down and you're looking at this workbook with a million different tabs in it and you're thinking, how can I make this better? And I'm looking to see what's taking all the time. Why, why am I spending, you know, till 11 p.m. every night trying to do this accounting work what's taking the most time how can i improve that process what pieces can i automate and if you don't know how to automate anything at least a little bit like from a minimum viable product standpoint then you're never going to be able to say i can take this piece of data and that piece of data and join it into the data that i need and then i can do this that actually books my journal entry for me there's a lot of that's a lot of creativity right there and i, I don't know that people think of it that way but, you know, you being a musician or an artist or any any sort of creative side of anybody, I think people think they check it at the door when they come into the accounting space. That's on them if they check it at the door. There's plenty of opportunity to flex that uh, within your day to day, but you got to flex it. That, you, you put that so eloquently and, and I think you just you just riff in, pardon the pun, on my... <laughs> My drum kit there. Um, no, that that was a great analogy because because you're absolutely right. I mean, there is um, there's, there's a certain amount of muscle memory that you need to build, you know, and that's that's why they say when you pick up a guitar that you never lose it because you've done the reps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so I've probably not picked up the guitars for you know a few weeks, maybe coming up to a month now. They're they're I can see the dust on them. They, they need a good <laughs> clean. Um, but you go back into that memory. Of, of that repeat activity to build that skill in the first place. And where AI has the edge, I guess, is it's it's almost being programmed with that muscle memory, which is why AI is pretty good at generating code, you know, because there's so much of it to be trained on. You know, the amount of code on the internet, you know, is, is, is amazing. You talk about taking a template from here, taking a template from here. That's all the AI is doing, you know, is it yeah. saying logically this plus this is the, or sorry, logically, this is the result of this query based on the most common, you know, um, data sets that, that I'm working from and all that sort of stuff. But coming back to the automation piece, I think because AI is still such a hype is people fall into the trap of thinking that AI and automation are the same thing mm -hmm. when, when they're totally not. And, and the way that I describe it is seeing automation as a digital pair of hands. So it, it is doing a sequence of events in the same way that you would, you know, um, chop up a chop up a carrot or oh, that's a bad example because you can chop up a carrot in some different <laughs> ways but but like um you know click a button on a screen you know uh move move a you know highlight a different cell you know update this formula all of that sort of stuff you know whereas ai is um digital brain and therefore should be used to support cognitive tasks rather than repeat tasks you see what I mean? And that's when I have my discussions and we talk about AI, I think in terms of augmentation and reducing that mental fatigue and expanding yourself with a digital brain versus trying to get AI to automate stuff because it, it, it is not a cookie cutter. You know, the, the variance in the sort of responses you're likely to get from, from AI is, is very different to writing a script as you say, yeah. you know, or performing a SQL query, you know, mm -hmm. if you write a SQL query with these parameters from this data set, you will get exactly the same result every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No creativity required, no temperature, you know, nothing like that. You know, if I do this, then I will a hundred percent get that. As soon as you go into the AI space, there is not that certainty anymore. You know, you can't say for certain that if you give an AI a complex equation or a complex problem to figure out that it's going to give the same answer every time. You know, the work, yeah. it, there's a good chance it would be accurate because the models are getting better and better, right? Mm -hmm. But the working out is going to be different, you know. Um, so you being able to have that base knowledge to be able to guide is going to be so important. And, and uh, I've been having conversations about, um, have you heard of this um this Devon tool. Uh, you hear about the release of Devon? 
A little bit, not not the details though. Yeah, so, cool. so it's, it's an autonomous agent that prompts itself. So instead of you having to continuously prompt the AI and give oh, the next wow. prompt to say, now do this, now do this, you just give it an outcome and say, I want you to build this, and it works it back itself. Wow. Yeah, so it will it will create its own prompts, you know, and it will it will seek out and do that problem solving piece to try and get to the output that it wants. One of the guys online, Ethan Mollick, sets it on Reddit. You know, so he basically set Devin up with a Reddit user so that it could post and gain feedback from the users in the community. So it was basically, you know, um, what do you want? Like, I'm building this. How can I make it better and all that sort of stuff? It started trying to charge people. Like, you know, <laughs> it, it, it read it itself, right, what's this worth to you? Do, do you see what I mean? You know, it so that's where it gets a little bit scary. Go monetization uh, strategy. That, that's already. it. And that, oh, that's where oh. the, the premise of autonomy gets a little bit scary because yeah. it's very difficult to determine fact from fiction when something is masquerading as an intelligent person. But, of course, with yeah. the right questions, you'd be able to find it out. But the reason I mentioned that is somebody picked it apart I can't remember his name because otherwise I'd, I'd mention it here. But he said the actual doing is maybe 20, 30% of the job. Like, you know, the actual writing the code is such a small portion of that activity. Wow. You know, 70% of the time is collabor collaborating with other people to define yeah. what do you want from it. You know, it's it's that it's that iterative process that spans mm -hmm. more than just the activity of doing something that takes up a lot of time. And that's, you know, that's where autonomy focused on one task isn't going to work. And that's where the scary piece with general intelligence comes is if you mm -hmm. imagine uh, um, an, an automated bot in the same way that Devin works, but then combined across all sorts of different tasks and functions. You know mm -hmm. that, that can then essentially act as a as a human brain, and that's where it gets a little bit scary. But I I still don't think we've got the compute power. But but there we go. Anyway, how how are we doing for time, Mike? I mean, I got a little bit more time if we want to keep chatting. I mean that that Devin thing sounds insane. Like I feel like everybody was shifting to I just gotta you know let's prompt engineer is going to be the next big job, but you've already got an AI doing the prompts for you, so that's uh. That's pretty wild, and even uh, I was using an AI product, and I, not to belabor the point, it's called a Notebook LM, which is really powerful too, but that was one where you can upload a document and you can ask it questions about the document, and it'll, you know, instead of you having to scan the 50-page document, it'll, it'll synthesize and it'll answer all your questions, basically like your own little chatbot for a particular document, or in some cases, tons and tons of documents. Um, and one of I was using it for a work thing and I was trying to I had all these questions I was asking it and it was I was mainly seeing how good it was. But it wasn't the fact that it was answering the questions, pulling the right parts of the document and answering it the right way. It was su suggesting things of like, maybe you should ask these questions, which I was <laughs> like, whoa, well, like if my role is to be able to ask hard questions that maybe people aren't thinking about to make sure, you know, the diligence is there. Well, I thought at least that was going to be safe, you know, and there's this, uh, this, uh, AI basically asking really insightful questions that I was like, damn, I guess, uh, you know, all of this is, it, it's moving fast. You know, I think things are just as fast as you had a prompt engineer being the next big thing. You got to learn how to write the prompt. You have another AI tool that's writing the prompts, too, and then acting on the results of the prompt output yeah. it's a yeah. it's a wild time it's crazy and, and and nobody knows the future i mean we can we can make an educated guess but but what i can say is with the finance teams that i've worked with it is still a real struggle to find legitimate ai use cases past mm. personal productivity yeah. so i'm a big fan of ai for speeding up writing process documentation, you know, um, helping with tricky decisions, you know, at, using it as a sounding board, as I say, using it as a second yeah. brain to speed up and, you know, reduce yeah. that mental fatigue, you know, to, to become more efficient. Right? But then in a business setting, that's where it gets really tricky, you know, because again, I don't think even some of the best developers yet still truly understand how to deploy, say, like an open AI model, AI model, 
mm-hmm. within a company infrastructure. And, I, and I'm sure people are doing it. Obviously, ChatGPT Enterprises, you know, on that premise, it's meant to, to, to be built into your, your data. But it still needs training, you know, b- yeah. because a language model that's optimized for chat from a personal perspective isn't going to work if it spans multiple disparate sets of company data. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you're not yet going to have an AI that spans department that can write SQL queries to produce the results that you want in the format that you want to see them in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it might come, but it's, it's still, I, I feel like, you know, AI at the moment has been just good enough and just impressive enough for everybody to adopt it because it can act as that ultimate productivity tool from a personal perspective. Yeah. But I feel from a business perspective, when we start looking into autonomy and the ability to instantly recall data and, you know, make informed decisions by just having a, a Q&A with your bot across, you know, especially for companies like yours, where you say you've got huge amounts of data, huge amounts of disparate systems, that's a way off. But I'll be eating my words in 12 to 24 months because the rate of change is that that we can't even predict where it's going to be. You know, and, and I've been yeah. saying to a couple of people that, you know, if you were literally just hands off with AI at the moment and decided to revisit it in six months, you'll have better tools. So you yeah. might spend yeah. the next six months implementing the current capability, whereas you might as well wait six months and do it twice as fast because the tools are better. Yeah, you see yeah. what I mean, but it's that balance because you've got to do something in the interim because there are some efficiency gains to to be gained from from doing it. But the one one recommendation that I've got for you, and I'd be yeah. interested to get your feedback on it. So you mentioned Lo- Notebook LM is a tool that you use. Mm-hmm. Have you heard of Jeddah dot AI? No, is that with a J or a G? J J E D A dot A I. No, and it comes back to what you were saying previously about speed so so yeah why would i use an ai to create an image or try and create a process flow diagram that i've then got to go through loads of iterations because it wasn't what i wanted and i've got to reprompt and re-ask the question or whatever when i can just draw it because i've got the vision in my head and i just want to draw yeah. it now jeddah obviously won't do that but they refer to it as a generative ai workspace um and, and as i i'll send you the link okay. but if you log into it you are met with a virtual whiteboard, yeah? Mm. And it will give you pre-canned visualizations. Yeah, so whether it's a mind map or a process flow, so you can say, create me a process flow for X, you know, and it will produce the visual for you extremely oh. quickly. So it won't be as good as what, what you do, and obviously it won't be the same as what's in your head getting down on mm-hmm. paper. But I was very impressed with A, the speed, and also that you got that instant gratification of having a visual that at least gave yeah. you a baseline. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so with the text-based stuff like your chat GPTs and your claws or whatever, you can get a quick text baseline. Yeah, so if you're writing content or, you know, writing process documentation, it gives you that starting point and you're away, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's sometimes the biggest challenge, isn't it? Starting. Yeah, you, you mentioned the, black pa- the blank page. Yeah. Yeah. You know, whether it's a drawing or, a, you know, a, a, a document, a Google Doc. Um, you know the the difficult piece is starting the writing, but if you can if you can get it started, and and I I find sometimes that I'll I'll have AI write something for me, I'll completely ignore what it wrote for me, but it's given me that kickstart. Enough. I've seen some yeah. words on a page, and it's given me the inspiration to continue, even though I've used nothing of what it's yeah. generated for me. Yeah. And, I, and I feel a little bit like that with, with Jedi AI. So yeah, I, I definitely have a chat about it. I, I want to get yeah. the dude that runs it on the podcast because we're connected on LinkedIn and we were due to, to have a bit of a meeting. Oh, cool. But that's, that's yeah. one of those where I look at it and think, actually, from a you know quick visual, yeah. let's get a bit of inspiration. Um, I, I was quite impressed by that. But no, it's, 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 it's obviously not Mike Manalak level of mind mapping <laughs> collaboration. It's but, probably... Like, it's probably 10 times more in, in a lot of ways, but I'll have to check it out because I, I totally agree with you. Like, I think people kind of, there's always these mini barriers to the next step that slow things down. And I think if you don't have to think about a starting point for, well, how do I visualize that? And then it just pops up. You're kind of already advanced to your point there. The barrier has been removed, even if it's not exactly what you want, like it moves you forward. 
And uh, there's a lot of value to that. And, and I think that's where most people are using it mainly, myself included, which is kind of like a productivity hack. Mm -hmm. Like you, you said the second brain, you said like bouncing ideas off of, I feel like that's where it's helped or I could spend, you know, 20 minutes revising this email to make it more concise, or I can just see an example really quick in five seconds, what a more concise version would look like. Excuse me. Um, but I feel like that's how most people are using it. The end to end thing is really hard, but maybe, maybe you don't need the end to end to be very powerful and, you know, an incredible advancement. And it's just the productive individual productivity hack. That's still not bad. You know what I mean? I think maybe the end to end is hard to do because there's so many moving pieces, even for something simple, you would have to write prompt after prompt. And even if there's something that can generate the prompt, does it know all the different details? And I think that's sort of where they, you know, you always hear the output's only as good as the person who can review the output to see that it so it looks right. Because AI is always 100% confident and it could be fault completely false, but it sounds so damn confident that it makes you feel like it's it's gold as an answer. So I don't know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm curious to see how far we can take even just these productivity hacks on an individual level, because I think you can take it pretty far. Yeah, I mean, I'd, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do what I do and have great conversations like this unless the tech was supporting me to be efficient in what I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, nobody's got an easy job. You know, jobs take time. People quite often work overtime, you know, especially if they want, you know, they want to get promoted and all that sort of, maybe we have you on again. Cause I know your, your book is entirely about, you know, um, ace in your interviews and, and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, no flux given def definitely check it out. Um, but it's, it's one of those where if I didn't have a decent set of tools that in reality I pay peanuts for, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to produce any of this stuff. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I would be, yeah, we wouldn't be here without the tech if, uh, essentially yeah. is, is the short way of saying that. Right. So yeah. you know, I think, I think, I think it's all, it's all valid points. It's all really valid points. So Mike, do you want to tell people where they can find out more about you? And then uh, I'll drop it all in the show notes and, and we can wrap up there because I appreciate it's uh, it's the middle of the day for you. <laughs> so you probably yeah. need to get back to work. <laughs> yeah, it's been, um, no, it's been fun chatting. Um, but yeah, you, you can find me on LinkedIn, Mike Manilak. Uh, I put out a lot of stuff there. But also check out my website, mikefromaccounting.com. It's uh, geared towards most mostly accountants that are maybe feeling stuck or feel like the opportunities that have presented themselves aren't aren't really what they would would really hope for maybe they're unfulfilled in some way so i try to show the fun and fulfilling side of accounting and talk a little bit about that here but the website's really based around that so i have a lot of the the articles i've written and illustrate them all myself so they're kind of fun but yet informative too and then i've got that course about uh you know virtual collaboration and how to to sort of be a leader in that space it's called um, sketchy business practices where i get get sketchy on a digital whiteboard so check that out uh and then the playbook which i called no flux given and uh that's how to land the accounting job of your dreams and essentially that came about me interviewing back and forth across silicon valley at, at some top companies like uh like your facebooks or amazon or nike salesforce uber or tesla twitter uh companies like that and uh failing a lot but then finally like getting a, a successful formula that i wanted to share out for anybody else that that has a dream job in the accounting space that maybe is probably very high competition to get that um and if anybody's looking for the edge on how they might want to to approach that check out that that playbook no flux given um but yeah shoot me shoot me a note any of your your listeners if you want to chat connect with me i'm pretty accessible but would love to come back and, and chat about more of this stuff uh ai or creativity side of things i feel like you've got a lot of good uh good topics going on these days so happy to come back and i'll be i'll i'll be looking forward to the future episodes with uh was it the jetta ai guy you got to get got to get him on Oh, yeah, got, got to get them on. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I mean, we've been we've been recording for an hour and fifteen now, and it feels like yeah. five minutes. So uh, yeah, 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 it's been fun. Be back on my, but no, absolute pleasure. I'll put it all in the show notes. So yeah, Mike from Accounting dot com. Check him out there. Connect on LinkedIn. But uh, no, it's been a pleasure, Mike. Really appreciate you coming on. 
Awesome. Thank you. Hey again, and thanks for listening. If you enjoyed what you heard today, don't forget to like, review, and subscribe. And for more goodies, head over to techforfinance.com. See you soon.